we are live and uh, pretty shortly people will start to filter in here um, and um, we can get started. Uh, before, you know, before we get started with our, our main event, uh, we're, we're actually started a minute early. So that's pretty awesome uh, off the bat here. And uh, Dr. Shoemaker and myself, we didn't actually have any trouble getting into the room. So that's another uh, bonus. We have something very interesting tonight. Um, we're going to be talking about direct intravenous ozone. Um, and it's, it's a controversial topic, um, at least in the human human medicine uh, field. So I, I thought it would be of interest for a lot of people. Um, and obviously our focus here is veterinary medicine. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about and, and discussing. But I will just say right off the bat here, um, I've, I've been able to talk with a number of practitioners in the ozone world, um, some of whom practice human medicine um, one in particular, Dr. Howard Robin, Robbins is well known in New York there. Um, uh, and he has done a lot of uh, DIV treatments on humans um, and has uh, um, seen some great results. And, and it's, it's interesting to be around those people and to talk to them. And Dr. Shoemaker, I don't know if you've met him and talked to him at all about, about DIV um, or not, but I'm sure you've, you've come across other people who are doing it. So I'm excited to hear kind of what your experience is. So here's how, here's how this is going to go tonight, guys. Um, we're going to, I'm going to give a brief introduction to Dr. Shoemaker. Um, she's going to take it and she's going to go through kind of just get us prepped for what we're going to talk about uh, regarding DIV by giving us a quick intro to ozone therapy. We're going to go through some, some things about DIV, and then we're going to watch a video that Dr. Shoemaker did just, uh, just this week, I believe. Um, just an hour ago. <laughs> just an hour ago um, on a horse. Um, so it's going to be a really eye-opening experience, I think, for us to be able to see really almost live <laughs> um, this treatment. So I'm excited about that. Um, I have a couple of polls here. And again, if you want to chat into guys the side there, that would be great. If you have questions as we're going along, um, please chat them into the box there. Type your comments in and uh, let us know. If you're having any issues with sound or with video, you can refresh at the top of your screen. That usually deals with the issue. Um, if we have any significant issues, I'll reset the whole room. Uh, but it uh, looks like uh, we're getting some comments. Uh, from uh, Dr. Rohr, uh, Patricia, Patricia Jew, good to see you. Uh, Dr. Timmerman, good to see you. Um, and uh, Dr. O'Leary as well says, hi, Dr. Shoemaker. So, uh, you know, there's, there's some people who are here who we know, um, and that's great to see. So Dr. Shoemaker has uh, been around veterinary medicine for at least two or three years, right? <laughs> Like, I'm a really old witch. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I think over 40 years, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so we met maybe six, seven years ago, I think would have been the first time. And uh, I've been uh, privileged to be able to talk to her and have her on a few times to, to do some webinar stuff. And she's a wealth of information um, in the holistic veterinary world. And so it's always really helpful to have people who um, know a lot, be willing to contribute. And that's what she's here to do tonight. I'm not gonna take any more time because I want her to have the time and, and you guys to have the time, but uh, good to see some more Dr. McCorkle, good to see you. Uh, Sasan, good to see you as well. Dr. Langhofer, great. I'm looking forward to what you have to say. So what I'm gonna do right now is turn it over to Dr. Shoemaker and she's gonna take it away. Hi everybody. Um, just for those of you who don't know me, I'm an 80 graduate of the University of Georgia. Started doing uh, integrative medicine at uh, very early in my career, about uh, in 1987. I got introduced to ozone in, um, gosh, it's probably been 23, 25 years. I have administered tens of thousands of ozone treatments, deep IV ozone treatments to horses in that time. So I feel pretty confident in the technique that I use. I've had very few side effects with it. So I really want you guys to get comfortable with it. This is all about 
understanding how good technique and just being safe is the very best way to do this. And you will, I will tell you, next to doing, being a veterinarian and doing chiropractic and acupuncture, which are my stock and trade, having an ozone machine has done more good for more animals than any other therapy that I use. I absolutely think that this is what everybody should be doing. I mean, this is really, there's very little wrong with anybody that's going to be made worse by more oxygen in and more toxins out. So with that, I want to just go through a lot of just the basic information that I do. One of the biggest things we have to do to make ozone work is we've got to get people to let us do it. We've got to let, have clients that are willing to let us stick a needle in the animal's neck and pump gas into its blood. You know, they're all sitting there thinking about, you know, a Hitchcock movie where, you know, somebody put a little bubble in an IV line and somebody dropped dead. That is not true. And by the way, with horses, I mean, this is a hopefully a veterinary discussion, but um, we tried back in the dark ages when we had live surgery pony when I went to school. When we were finished and we were doing the euthanasia surgery for our little ponies, we tried to see how much gas it would take to embolize a horse. And it takes about three liters of air fast push with a pump to embolize a small pony. And that's air. Ozone, it is not going to happen. There is so much blood volume and there is so much turbulence and there is so much, this is oxygen. Medical grade ozone is oxygen, it's pure oxygen, which dissolves really rapidly in the tissues. So you don't get any of the dangers of nitrogen or air emboli causing a problem. So you can put that worry right out of your head and also tell the clients the very same thing. So I just want to reassure everybody that right now we just don't have to worry about that. So let's get started, Jonathan, on the, on the talk, because these are the things I tell my clients when they're interested in this, which helps them get used to the idea of ozone. Great. I'm going to, right before we do that, I'm going to publish a poll. If you guys can just click um, kind of on that and we can get an idea of who's here, um, that would be great. So if anybody answers number three there in the lineup, um, more than one person answers that one, I know somebody's lying because it says, I am Dr. Judith Shoemaker. So. <laughs> um, but uh, okay, so good. Um, it's it's, it's uh, going to be a, a sampling, but go ahead and click on that and let us know whether you're a veterinarian or you're somebody who's uh, here uh, interested in treating your pets with ozone therapy, or I'm sorry, I don't have an other there. I could have done that, but uh, good. looks like we have a, about a 50-50 you know, split, more or less. Um, I'm going to put that one to rest, and we're going to jump into our... Uh, presentation. So uh, let's see, go ahead and start that. All right. This is my practice, which is always helpful veterinary services. And I am at 305 Nottingham Road, Nottingham, PA. That's my phone number, my fax number, and my website. And you guys are welcome to email me from the website if you have any questions. So we're really looking forward to having more of you get comfortable in using ozone. All righty, it's been around a long, long time. It's been studied and used in medicine for a long, long time. And again, we do not want to worry about air embolisms. And properly administered medical ozone is not going to cause a problem. And there are so few detrimental effects. We'll discuss these later on in the actual discussion of administration. We don't really have to worry too much about these things. You know where it comes from, you know where it goes. It's all about making the grass green and cleaning up the atmosphere. And it does that for animals too. All right, so very much ozone history. We want to use ozone. It's been studied. It has been used even in medical schools prior to you know, the advent of modern medicine with antibiotics and such, but it was had a very, very big following back in the early portion of the 20th century. And again, systematic suppression of all modalities of treatment that did not complement the emerging um, pharmacologic and diagnostic industries, which are, you know, what support all of this. So anyway, 
that is one of the things that we have to realize. And that is one of the things we're working against. We have to find a very credible way to introduce and reintroduce these things into the system. And that is where people keep records. If you keep records and we can make sure that people understand that we have tens of thousands of cases where we've gotten obvious benefit and that we document that benefit, then we're going to be able to compile that even somewhat subjective information into useful objective stuff that, you know, that we're going to have to be able to look at. All right. So less suppression occurred in Europe, especially Russia, Germany. Ozone is, is very commonplace. 7,000 doctors in Germany, this was about 15 years ago, but again, the documented ozone generators are used very frequently in standard medical therapy. So again, we really see a big help in um, problems with uh, uh, paralysis. I see a huge help in trying to stop ascending um, demyelinating diseases. Not necessarily that we're going to cure them, but we can slow things down a lot because a lot of that damage is uncontrolled oxidative damage that is not being helped by the uh, free radical scavenging system, which has been turned off. Ozone stimulates the free radical scavenging system. Ozone generators, relatively simple. You can use non-reactive uh, uh, equipment. Um, I don't necessarily use non-reactive equipment. I just change it frequently. So again, we can talk about this when I show you my very, very practical technique for delivering ozone IV to horses. Generators, you know about this, UV lamps, corona discharge, cold plasma generators, which produce the best quality stuff. And those are one reason why ozone is so inexpensive is a lot of the... Uh, a lot of that uh, equipment, the cold plasma generators, Tesla's family owns the patents. They're not interested in protecting them. So that's why ozone machinery is so inexpensive, so affordable. And O3 Vets is producing quality equipment that you can use and know that you are getting accurately uh, dispensed and accurately measured regulated ozone for your medical applications. So in in micrograms per milliliter or grams per liter of oxygen, 5% or 70 micrograms per milliliter is the maximum concentration used in clinical medical applications. If you use 70 micrograms per milliliters IV, you're going to damage red cells and they may cause hemolysis. I usually deliver anywhere from 35 to 65 in using direct IV treatments and that's pretty safe. So very high concentrations can be used to ozonate fluids quickly. If you're using as a direct IV application, you can ozonate fluids and then give that straight IV. And that will deliver a safe 27 microgram per milliliter. So direct IV infusions usually, as I say, run even for horses, always be between 35 and 55 micrograms per milliliter. Frequency of protocols, absolutely, they vary extremely wildly. And initial high dose treatments in cancer cases can sometimes jumpstart the immune system followed by lower doses. Those who are fearful, starting slow, going low, will still have good results. I personally let the animal tell me how this works so that it's a matter of making sure that they are not overwhelmed by it. You remember you are going to cause a rapid detoxification and a rapid upgrading of uh, uh, the systems, the liver and the kidneys, the systems for detoxification. But again, you don't want to kill as much tumor or have a Herxheimer's reaction. It's gonna overwhelm the liver or the kidneys. So it's important to do you know, proper things to prepare the system to handle a sudden cleanup. You know, if you, go out and run like mad or go out on Memorial Day and play volleyball and work really hard or, you know, do whatever and you sweat a bunch and you breathe really hard. Yeah, your face breaks out the next week. You may feel like you got a little hangover the next morning and that's just because you dislodged a lot of stuff out of your system by breathing hard and creating the singlet oxygen that happens with exercise. So, 
ozone is like exercise without the exercise. It really helps a lot of things. We can talk about the mechanisms if people are interested, but generally I want to move on to talking about this practicalities of administering it. So concentrations must be carefully controlled with accurate flow rates. You need to have proper pediatric regulators for the slow flow rates that produce medical concentrations. Homemade machines, lesser quality non-medical devices are not appropriate. Ozone potentiates free radical scavenging systems, and it induces the production of SOD, catalase, and glutathione peroxidase, which are the things that absolutely protect tissues from severe oxidative damage from not just, you know, well, it's not a free radical ozone, it's an ion, it acts as a, as a, uh, uh, a normal part of the system, in the body, but we do want to protect from other free radicals in the system that don't have nice uh, side effects and that don't have nice byproducts and end products. So the simplest thing that ozone does and using medical ozone is you're jugging the system with oxygen and complete oxidation of sugars and other fuels produce efficient energy and burn clean the CO2 water and inert end products. This is one of the most important things that giving ozone, medical ozone, medical oxygen therapies does. Not enough oxidation occurs, not enough oxygen is available. You have carbon monoxide, lactic acid, partially oxidized toxins that inhibit further oxygen metabolism. And this is really important in the current epidemic this is what is occurring when we don't have enough oxygen in the system, is that we end up with carbon monoxide-like effects in the system, which paralyzes the ability of red cells to take on and give off oxygen to the system. And the damage that's done by many illnesses, but particularly the one that we're dealing right now, is the tying up of hemoglobin and the ability of the red cells to take on and give off oxygen more and more. Instead, they do it less and less, as we have with things like carbon monoxide poisoning, cyanide poisoning, things of this variety. And that then potentiates in the system the, uh, the rouleau formation, the stickiness of red cells, all of these things that can then result in microemboli. So this is one reason why this is such an amazing uh, thing to be able to stop, is to make sure that we burn clean in the first place, that we eliminate and oxidize the toxin, toxins that can stop further oxygen metabolism and further oxygen exchange. One of the things that when a singlet oxygen lands on a little red cell, that little red cell gives off a magnesium ion, which then helps to open up vessels and help to eliminate some of the clogging mechanism. It also potentiates that hemoglobin that's inside that cell to take on O2 and give off O2 more effectively. And this is really important. All right, once again, cannot cause emboli when injected at reasonable rates as the mixtures dissolve and diffuse very quickly in bodily fluids. Nitrogen doesn't do that. If it causes any respiratory irritation, because if there's outgassing as the, as the lungs get a, a round of ozone through them, it can cause coughing because respiratory, whoops, respiratory, did I just do something? I did do something. There you go. If ozone administration causes any respiratory irritation from outgassing through the lungs, we then are going to have a problem with them coughing. And I have never had to end a coughing ep you know, episode with one to five grams of vitamin C, but that is certainly in the literature that if somebody has a problem with outgassing of ozone through the lungs and affecting and irritating the respiratory epithelium, then that is uh, that is what's happening there. All right. Well, I got a quick question for you um, regarding uh, the. I'm going to go back here real quick. Mm -hmm. So not causing an emboli. Um, we're going to be talking about DIV in horses. Yep. Uh, what about um, you know? And you mentioned it has to be at a reasonable rate. When we talk about small animals, um, you know, what about small animals? Is there more potential for causing an emboli there? Yeah, there is because they are tiny and, and especially really little ones, but they're in a situation like that. You can deliver a very effective dose of ozone if, you, if you're if you already, um, if you have a catheter set up and such like that, if you're delivering fluids, is you can deliver it in fluids. Fluids provide, a if you ozonate fluids, 
with very strong ozone, fluids will saturate at about 27 micrograms per milliliter. And then you just deliver that very slowly and you can continually, you can keep the, uh, the fluids being ozonated because of course they will off gas and, and the ozone will, evap will uh, does, uh, come out of solution, but you can keep on ozonating your fluid bag while you deliver it and deliver it at whatever speed that animal can handle. And that's a perfectly good way right there. It's very similar to um, major auto hemotherapy. You're just adding okay. it through fluids. Um, I, but I definitely, with the small animals, personally, I have always used rectal ozone or ozonated sub-Q fluids to mm -hmm. deliver ozone. And rectal ozone in suppletion is just, and it's written in all the literature, is just about as effective as, D, as DIV. And it's certainly easy to do, you know, putting a red rubber mm -hmm. catheter up somebody's butt unless they want to turn around and bite you is not a really hard thing to do. And we have animals that know and the effect of, now we oftentimes make them sit, we make them sit and have, uh, uh, you know, sit for 20 minutes, somebody holding their tail down. But uh, from what I read in the literature at this point, um, apparently the effect of rectal ozone is almost instantaneous. Within 10 to 30 seconds, you've had a pretty good dissemination of this stuff. And I have treated myself um, with ozone, both intravenously and um, rectally, and neither one has caused major discomfort. Um, doing it IV, I must say, it feels kind of like you've got fizzies in your brain, but uh, that is certainly something that I, you know, I, 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 I'm never going to do anything to an animal that I haven't done to myself. Good but, answer. Uh, yeah. We have a couple questions on vitamin C. Yep. Um, and its use with ozone therapy. So there's questions about whether or not those should be separated, um, you know? Yep, I, I absolutely, um, I have routinely, when I am using other therapies, like if I use orgotian or other things, even uh, things like hyaluronic acid or adequan or other things that are have an antioxidant effect, I tend to separate them by at least four hours. I do know of several people that give their ozone rectally at the same time as giving um, intravenous vitamin C, but I just, I would rather not try to bind up my ozone. So my experience has been to separate the use of antioxidants by at least four hours, either four hours before or four hours after. If one is giving ozone on a regular basis, you know, if you're giving it for cancer therapy of you know, two, three times a week or even daily, then I think it is probably a good idea to help the um, free radical scavenging system molecules that you want to put in glutathione precursors, you want to have sufficient levels of other antioxidants so that the system can replenish its free radical scavenging system that's being triggered by uh, very short term bolus doses of oxygen. Yeah. So, so you're saying you separate, you would recommend separating by four hours the yeah. IV, C, IV vitamin C yeah. with the ozone, regardless of how you administer the ozone. Yes. Yeah. I think that's probably a good idea. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I would say that would be best practice. However, practically, um, you know, is that, uh, is that always possible? you know, with a patient? Not or, if you're giving IV, you know, vitamin Cs. Maybe you're not going to separate them that much. Um, I certainly don't have a, a way to evaluate what's been effective and what's been less effective, but mm -hmm. I'm just going on the principle that other people have, have, uh, have expounded upon previously. And I have, um, you know, most of the time I have, when I've given direct IV ozone, it's been on an animal that I have here in my office. And they may be on a, uh, a, a supplement program that's giving them their antioxidant, you know, backup. And I have, I'm doing some direct IV vitamin C's next week, and I'm asking my clients to, uh, I'm asking my clients to be able to have if they're going to have an uh, an ozone treatment, they have an ozone machine at home that they, uh, you know, that they they separate that. Okay. And that is something. I mean, the the fact that O3 Vets has got machinery that's appropriate for people to do at home then it certainly is going to make the practice of veterinary medicine where we're doing things that can't be done at home. It's going to make it, make it so that they can have the benefit of these things. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, this way. And, so, uh, there. Um, so I've got a couple questions here too about um, um, doing DIV. Do you give the vitamin C if there's coughing or an issue? Do you give it orally or do you give the IV? They're saying to suppress that that coughing. Now I've never necessarily heard of doing that actually, but what are your thoughts? You know what? You are never going to see an animal cough with any amount of ozone that you give it. In 20 years of practice, giving probably sometimes up to five and ten ozone treatments a day in small animals and horses. I mean, over 20 years, I have delivered a heck of a lot of ozone. I have never had an animal cough. Okay. Not so we're not talking about breathing in ozone. Yeah. No, they're not. I'm talking about if they cough because of off-gassing of the ozone from their own blood. From their system. Yeah. Oh. yeah. No, they, yeah. We're, not, we're not letting them breathe ozone. That will definitely make them cough. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. Right. No, yeah. you're not going to, you know, you sell scab. Okay. Systems. I mean, my airflow in the office is sufficient that I don't worry about it. You know, I don't have off-gassing, you know, ozone traps because we have enough airflow that we don't worry about that. Nobody's ever coughed over it. None of my technicians making ozone have coughed over it. You know, it's not anything that's a real big deal. And remember, the level of ozone that's going to make you cough is so much below the toxic level. Yeah. It's not even. You're never going to get there. You're never going to get there. Yep. You wouldn't be able to stay in the room. Right, exactly. Toxic yeah. Low. Yep. All right, well, there's a lot of questions, but we got to keep going because I want to get to this video. Yeah, let's see if we can do this. Okay, ozone administration, IV, major autohemotherapy, all the different lists. You all know these things. These are just ways that it can be delivered. All this stuff's going to be available. This, you know, all this uh, information is going to be available to you. Um, there is so much that you can do with ozone. And... Disc protrusions, this is interesting, prolotherapy injected into the interspinous space and around facets, stabilizing joints and accelerating healing, way useful. Uh, prolozone, using prolotherapy with those, all of my prolo uh, treatments are done with ozone in them. It's usefulness, as I say, any cancer, any viral, any bacterial, any fungal, unsurpassed, since there's no appreciable side effect from it, absolutely. And deficit is the key to the development and progression of all diseases. We all know this good stuff. Um, antioxidants help protect the body from excessive oxidative damage, causing multiple free radicals, many of which are inactivated by ozone. A lot of free ozone is actually a free radical scavenger itself. But the bolus dose of ozone in the system will trigger a, a deadened antioxidant scavenging or a scavenging system that has just been minimally uh, stressed over time and just it's very much like you know you put the frog in the dish of water and you heat the water up slowly and when the frog really needs to be jumping out he can't that's the system with the body when it has low level insult all the time it develops a tolerance for that and the antioxidants are in the are not doing their job until they get waked up by a dose of ozone so again, long-term uh, ozone therapy can be augmented by supplementation with antioxidants, but they shouldn't, again, be administered within four to 12 hours of ozone therapies. So that's my feeling about it. So it produces the same effects as exercise, which produces significantly more, quote, unquote, free radical. I don't like to call it free radical oxygen um, because it's not. It's a normal thing that happens in the body. You have peroxidases that rip off the singlet oxygens um, you know, from from peroxides, from H2O2s, and they rip off a singlet oxygen to actually use that oxygen in metabolic processes. Metabolic processes such as the optimization of bacteria by white cells, such as the, the activation of lymphocytes and the activation of T killer cells. Those all require a free, uh, you know, a, a singlet oxygen to work. Now, the other nice thing about ozone equaling exercise in the syringe, what if you've got a foundered horse? That horse cannot exercise. He is so painful, he's not even moving his diaphragm sufficiently to breathe well. But you can give him the benefit of exercise through ozone. And this is one of the most useful ways that we use it is in horses with laminitis. Remember that thing about making sure that those vessels are open in their feet. It's pretty nice. Potentiates more complete oxidation, but it really helps and increases the effects of vitamins, herbs, homeopathics, drugs, all of these things. 
and it reduces the amount of chemotherapy that's been needed to be used in my practice by a quarter to three quarters. I have the animals that cannot tolerate carboplatin in therapeutic doses. But carboplatin works like a champ. Concurrently with ozone, I can use one quarter of the dose and get the same effect or more without the side effects. And I work with a lot of oncologists that, you know, they say, well, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it because this animal's getting better. And even animals that have become, uh, the cancers that have become resistant to chemotherapy devices, when you do add in ozone to them, they become effective again. So this is very nice. The biggest thing is, is that it improves the affect and the sense of well-being in patients. And I know that firsthand. When I do ozone, I stop hurting. It has marvelous pain reducing effects. Mm. It really is pretty amazing. And the sense of well-being thing and the brain being, you know, working better. My oxygen levels, you know, we all are sitting here breathing in masks. So our oxygen levels may be down if we've been 11 hours in a mask. So doing ozone is very, very helpful. Again, healing crises can occur and continued therapy facilitates rapid re resolution. It gets the toxins out. Metabolic normalization can occur. You can have horses specifically that are metabolic and insulin resistant and you get it. What is this cure for insulin resistance, guys? Exercise. So if they can't exercise because their feet hurt or they're so fat that they're gonna damage their joints or they're gonna overheat or they can't exercise because they're non-sweaters, you have a way of helping them. This is an amazing thing. And again, healing from the inside, Herring's Law will, you'll watch Herring's Law occur. Inside to outside, top to bottom, front to rear, and inverse chronologic order the insults of the body, meaning that you will get the deep organs of detoxification to start to work correctly. The liver and the kidneys need oxygen. The kidneys and the brain are the most sensitive organs to oxygen deprivation. You give those guys what they need, they'll start to work. And this is how I talk to my clients so that I can get the job done and keep them from worrying and get them excited about ongoing ozone therapy. So from the inside to the outside, from the deep organs to the outside, from the top to the bottom, they usually do get better from the top to the bottom. And a lot of times, especially if nervous systems affected, you're gonna see skin lesions even. You're gonna see exteriorization through the skin you may even see with certain neurologic problems, neurologic lines and stuff, you may see something that looks a little bit like shingles as they clear the stuff out of their nerves or herpes type eruptions. But they do not, if you keep treating with ozone, they are non-problematic. They don't hurt. They don't last a long time, but you need to keep working with them. Inside to outside, top to bottom, front to rear, there's better circulation in the front of the body and in reverse chronological order of insults. You know, the, the latest cut, or scar will clean up first. The last set of vaccines will exteriorize and stop bothering them. Then you keep working backwards through that. And it does not take as long to clean it up as it took to have the problem. So you can look with ozone to having an animal back to a much more pristine state in a relatively short period of time. So this is where I think, yeah, this is where I think we start our video. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start another poll because I want to see who's who would be comfortable. Go ahead and click on that. Would you feel comfortable using DIV in large animals? So I want to see if there's, you know, again, 100% of people at this point, um, or 40% or whatever. <laughs> Let's see what we got, you know, what do, how, what do people feel um, about that? You know, and remember, uh, I have delivered, I mean, I did an ozone treatment today. I will go on the road. I will give on a road trip or something. I'll give 25 or 30 ozone treatments. And so, in, Okay, in, go ahead. In the years that I've been doing this, the worst result that I've ever seen in an animal, I'll give you my absolute worst, was a horse that was dying of rhodococcus pneumonia. It was mm. rhodococcus in foals. And, but it was an older horse. It was a three-year-old that had developed a rhodococcus pneumonia. And this horse had stovepipe legs, you know, hocks to the ground, absolutely as big around as telephone poles and starting into autoimmune mediated degenerative desmopathy. Ankles were dropping, horse was sagging, went to New Bolton. They said, this horse is gonna die, you know? So we brought it home, we gave it ozone and it had a, a pretty good healing crisis. We had a pretty good Herxheimer's reaction. The horse sweat 
like I had just given it Prostin. It sweat puddles, you know, two feet around each leg. Water ran off of its chin. It looked colicky. It laid down. It tried to put all four feet up in the air. It was a pretty miserable puppy for about an hour and a half. Well, it was a dead horse anyway, so we just got it up and, you know, hosed it off and took it for a walk. The second ozone treatment, it sweat about half as much. The third ozone treatment, it didn't react. By the fifth ozone treatment, its legs were going down. That horse showed at Devon and won its class that fall. We had no wow. side effects. The horse never got laminitis. The right. horse asthmopathy did not continue. And the horse looked pretty fine. But the worst, that's the worst reaction I've ever seen was the sweating. Just, I mean, just like giving a dose of, of, uh, of uh, Prostin, you know, to, or little ice to get a mare to come back into heat. And sometimes they sweat and look pretty colicky. That's because it's a prostaglandin release. The other thing is that we'll sometimes see horses have a little bit of a gas-like colic spasm, and that's mainly because they are actually going into parasympathetic mode as their heart rates go down and their guts get more active. And so if they've got a little gas in their gut and they clamp down on it, it hurts a little bit. Mm. We just give them a little Nux Vomica Home Accord or we just give them a little rescue remedy and take them for a walk and they're all usually pretty much better. So real quick question here. Uh, well, the poll, 83% are comfortable with it. 16% say no, and I don't know where the 1% we're missing went. Sure. Um, but uh, that's that's where we're at with that. Now, do you use anything other than DIV for ozone on horses? No, that's it. I mean, okay. I have I have when ozone machines were not readily available that used medical oxygen. I had several clients buy ones that were ozone that used ozone concentrators from the um, from the uh, uh, from the air. Now, I wasn't liking that because you're taking in nitrogen as well when you're doing some of that. There is some nitrogen, but they would use that rectally. And they gave uh, rectal insufflations with ozone, you know, mixed with air. Um, and uh, they didn't have any bad problems. And they were treating, again, they were treating laminitic horses that, uh, that were unable to walk. And they were going to be dead anyway. And they actually all did very, very nicely. So they never had any side effects from that. Okay. So... Um, if there's any issue, if somebody has any, you know, of the 16% that are there, um, you know, let us know if there's any question I can answer about that, you know, write the questions or what your concerns are. We'll try to address that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So video, right? Yep. We're going to jump to this video now. Um, uh, video will play the audio as well. If you have any trouble, please chat it in there with seeing or hearing it. At, at a certain point in this video, it is going to be sideways, so you'll just have to kind of deal with that. But I think you can get a pretty good view here of uh, uh, what's going on. So this is a 15-minute video. I think we're going to play the whole thing. Judith, if you want me to stop it at a certain point, you let me know. Okay. Um, but this is going to really give us a great overview. This, she just did this to, yesterday or today again, and we got it here um, to watch. So we're, this will give us a great view of DIV being done live. Um, Sorry about yeah. the sideways. If you guys can turn your computer sideways so you don't get upside down, that's great. So, uh, yeah. I, there we go. Did you, how about the, did you get the first one? Yeah, let's see here. All right, because the first one's the description of how I make it, what I'm doing, how I, how I get ready to do my treatment. Yeah, got, hold, on, hold on a second. We're going to jump in and uh, let's see. It looks like we got this second video here yeah that's the second one. let's do the first one first uh -huh. now that's interesting because i did have the first one pulled up when i put it in here so uh let's exit that and um okay let me add an another video and see if this is the right one It looks like the same video. Um, tell you what, I'm waiting for that link. Um, for some reason, it's pulling up that that is the link that I've I've got, but it looks like it's the video, the correct video. So I'm not sure what's happening there. Okay. Um, she may have sent it to you twice, so might look elsewhere too if it'll do it. Okay. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna start this one, and then we'll jump back. 
um, when I get that other one up. And how many of you can, you know, how many of you can turn your computer sideways, computer yeah. sideways? Yeah. So sorry about that. All right. So we'll listen to the talk on it. And if, if you can hear it, great. I'm listening to the horse's heart. And I always check what their resting heart rate is ahead of time, what they sound like, what's going on. If I have a horse that's got murmurs or aortic. Uh, uh, so the resting heart rate's 36. She's going to move in after I do that. And we'll see how the, how the audio sounds. If it sounds awful. Um, what I was going to ask um, here is if you think that if that audio quality is not good enough, I will narrate. Well, I'm not, I'm not getting this. Okay. No, hold on a second here. There we go. Let me try the tubing. Yeah. 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 So I've got six 60cc syringes of ozone in my pockets. Okay, can you stop a second? Can we stop a second? Come up in the uh, in the needle itself. If you get a flash into your needle, that is a clot. What uh, this video is? Uh, yeah, like we're here. lagging. We're lagging behind here. We're. I don't know if this thing's working for you, but I'm not getting the video. Okay, so that's it. Right. Yeah, I'm hearing a second video going at the same time, it sounds like. I don't know if it's on your side. Or... Back, back side of me. Nope. Now, I'm going to, that the other, the amount of air that you're getting there is not significant. It's almost impossible to embolize a horse because. So, about I'm going to stop the video because I think we've got two of them going here. Yeah, I think you do. I think you got two going. I've got, so. so Let's try this again. I'm gonna I'm gonna try this one more time here. All right, and we're gonna fast forward. Rubber ducky duct tape. Okay. Okay, and come on around here so we can see. Is that working? Pull off both jugular veins. Yeah. Easier for you to see your vein, of course. And build it towards you. You're going to insert your needle in the center of the jugular vein, and you're going to be very careful and look to see when you get a little tiny flash, you're not going to fill the hook. You want to just Why don't you mute your, mute your microphone, Dr. Shoemaker? Mute your microphone. If you get a flash into your needle, that is going to clot. Well, you're going to keep his head still. Um, you're going to keep that, you want to keep that very, very flush against his neck like that. And then you're going to take your tape. We have different tape for different times of the year. There's my rubber butt ducky tape for summertime. Okay, so that's it. All right, now I'm going to make sure after I place this again, I'm going to make sure that we're wiggling his head around. It didn't go back through the back side of the vein. Now I'm going to put that together. The amount of air that you're getting there is not significant. It's almost impossible to embolize a horse because the amount of blood you're talking about and the, and the turbulence is great. So I'm going to deliver this in about two to three cc's a second. I'm also listening to make sure that I got little Hold tiny on. bubbles. I can hear the little tiny bubbles in his jugular vein. Here. So yeah, always course. make sure you get little tiny and bubbles. And double you. And then say, when you doubt it's Search and needle. Stop. The center of the jugular vein. Check to make sure the horse is going to be very careful to look and look and see when you get a little tiny flash. Not so you want to make sure they'll just not do very well. So again. As with banding or anything else, you definitely want to just make sure if the horse wiggles, stop. Check your vein, make sure you're hearing tiny bubbles, make sure that it feels like it's in this empty garden hose. And I'm delivering this, as I say, at about two to three cc. Gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. 
Periodically, I'm going to strip the jugular vein because, again, their heart slows down. There's a little back up here of ozone, and I don't want to have a big, huge bolus of ozone in the jugular because if it flips, you know, the bubble goes back up here and hits them up here in their, their vessels up here. They don't like the feeling of that. Direct IV ozone feels really cool. It's kind of, you feel the bubbles. It's like effervescence in the vasculature. I've had it done myself. And it's a very interesting feeling. Horses like it a lot. They go into the ozone. They're really interested in this. I'm still hearing little tiny bubbles. I usually try to empty my syringes in the order that I fill them so that my rubber stoppers don't get any extra mileage. I make sure that I add this loop here so that I have enough room. If I have to replace my needle, I don't have to untape my, my uh my uh, extension set. I always listen to make sure if the horse has moved at all that I still am hearing little tiny bubbles. If you do happen to place your needle originally and it gets into the artery, a 25 gauge needle is not predictably going to have enough volume uh, ability to let you get a squirt back out. But sometimes it will tell you you're in the artery, but you don't hear little tiny bubbles as you deliver if you are in an artery. Now, this horse is, has had ozone previously, so he is not at all perturbed by it. His heart rate's gone down to 32. And he has this lovely now split second heart sound because he's a great big huge fit athlete. And of course his left heart is enough bigger that he is having slightly asynchronous um, valve closure. And that again is just a really normal big strong heart. tiny bubbles, I'll hold off his other jugular vein, make sure I get some more blood down in this one. And I got my little tiny bubbles back. You can hear the big bubble of ozone going down there. And my bubbles are back. He was beginning to get enough of a buildup of, of ozone in the base of his jugular vein that I wasn't hearing the bubbles. So that's what I hadn't stripped his vein quite as much. I have delivered probably tens of thousands of doses of ozone to horses. And knock on wood, I have never had an inappropriate reaction. I've never hit a horse in the bay in the artery. I've had other practitioners and other other clients that got their own ozone machines, not use good technique, and who have been given an arterial injection. It is not necessary to ever have an arterial injection. You stop if you're not sure and you watch and you pay attention to what you're doing. Now He's starting to chew and act like his upper lip itches, so I'm going to slow down a little bit because that's one of the things is that if they're starting to off gas into their lungs, they're going to be beginning to get enough of a buildup of ozone in the base of his jugular vein that I wasn't Okay, so you need to turn your microphone off, Dr. Shoemaker, or else it's feedback during the video. Sorry. They itch a little bit. If they start having phlegm, it means that they're they're feeling a little bit full of ozone. And some horses don't take more than four to five syringes the first time. I don't remember whether he was a four or five horse, but that was four and we're start, or five and he's starting on a sixth right now. And he's, he's saying he's just about full. But we're gonna go ahead and put all six into him. So what can happen? He's pretty, yes, he's pretty much, he's pretty much done, he says. Nose is itching. Okay. So 
So I'm going to stop at five and a half. All right, now what's going to happen? Ozone is going to open up all the peripheral vessels. It's going to attach to red cells. Those red cells are going to be much better at taking on and giving off oxygen. Their hemoglobin is going to be much better at it. Magnesium ions are going to be reduced, re released from the, opposite, from the side of the red cell, uh, cell membrane. It's going to open up vessels even more. Blood pressure may go down, which when that happens, parasympathetic tone goes up and he may have a little bit more peristalsis. If he's got gas in his guts, he may have a little bit of, a little bit of uh, spasmodic pain or gas pain. We normally just give them a little nux vomica and a little rescue remedy and take them for a walk and they're usually fine. Some horses may have healing crises. They may have skin re uh, reactions in the next couple of days if they're detoxing, but generally very few reactions and they, everything you do gets better. Everything you work with, all of your techniques are going to work better. So if you have any questions, you can contact me at Always Helpful Veterinary Services. Our website is www.judithshoemaker.com, um, and we are in Nottingham, PA. You can contact us by email at any time. Our office phone number is 717-529-0526. Thanks very much. Okay, so now we need to reactivate our microphones. There you and, go. Uh, so um, we have we have ten minutes. All right. And so what went on there? Obviously, is we were we were running a little bit. We were running the audio of one and the video of another. This is going to get put together, guys, and we will turn it into something that you can use. The biggest thing I want you to realize is that it is super easy to do. I'm using a 25 gauge, one and a half inch needle. The other video talks about the setup for that, and we'll we'll get with the with the program there and get this video sorted out for you but as you can see it's a matter of inserting the needle taping it in so that you have uh, enough spare iv extension set tubing to manipulate your needle if you need to but that it is taped down flat so that it stays parallel in the vein that's the way to stay safe and then you just deliver it at two to three milliliters per per second you know, one hippopotamus, two hippopotamus, and they do not seem to have a problem with it. One of the most important things that you need to do is that thing we said in the beginning of when you place the needle, make absolutely sure that you are looking down the needle and that you just get this tiny little bubble at the end of the needle. You do not want to flash in your hub. It will clot and you will not get your ozone in there. It will clot. So you just look to see that there's a little blob of blood coming up to the end of the needle, and then you let, while you're holding it off, you're holding off the jugular vein, you're placing your needle, and you look down it while you hold off the jugular vein. See that little blob in the end of the needle? Don't hold the jugular off anymore. Go ahead and put your, put your tubing on and, and uh, tape it down. Okay, so what questions can I answer here? How many of you feel you can do this? <laughs> So, so what was the concentration again that you used? The concentration that I have on this machine at a delivery, and I don't know what yours, this is a nameless machine here. I'm sorry, Jonathan, it's not one of yours. I acquired it probably before Ooh. you were born. Um, <laughs> so anyway, this is my, this Sounds is like my, you're due for an upgrade. Yeah, no, this is my, this is one of my <laughs> old machines. And at that point at a quarter of a liter per minute flow, on the maximum output on this thing, I'm getting 40, I'm getting 40 micrograms per milliliter. Okay. So, and this, you know, when you have variability of both flow and the strength of your, of your plasma field, you can get any concentration you want. So, you know, I can vary this from 4.8 micrograms per milliliter up to 165, you know, at uh, you know, at uh, an eighth of a liter per minute flow. So again, and I disinfect my office with it too. So anyway, um, that is on that. It's forty for the horse's IV. That's pretty safe. That's a relatively conservative way of delivering it. I do the dogs at about thirty, which is the same thing as as what uh, ozone uh, saturates fluids with. So people are worried about getting into the artery. I think that's the biggest concern, right? Um, you don't want to do that. No, no. So, and the way that you way that you avoid that, I mean, knock on wood. 
veterinarians say, well, everybody's going to have an intraarterial stick one time. I am 40 years in practice and I have never done an intraarterial stick on anything, with any drug, with anything. If I think that there might be a problem, I stop. Okay. The point is, is it with a one and a half inch, 25 gauge needle, and you've got a garden hose that you're trying to go into that is a whole lot more superficial than the carotid artery, and you put it in and you tape it flat, you tape it parallel, you tape it flat, you're not going to get into the artery. Now, if the horse flexes his neck like this, it can push and go through the back side of the vein. If the horse flexes and does something like that, I stop. And I go and I pull the needle out until I hear it pop back out of the back side of the vein and it's back in the garden hose. I don't inject unless I know I'm in the vein. And it is very obvious when you're in the vein and it's very obvious when you're not in the vein. If you are through the back side of the vein and you're not into the artery and you try to put OSHA ozone in, you get resistance and the horse doesn't like it because you're putting a little bit of, 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 you know, you're getting an expanding gas you know, in the, in the side, in the wall of the vein. And there's a whole lot of stuff. I mean, most of you that are veterinarians, you know what it feels like to be in the vein. You know, you're sticking a needle into a garden hose. You know, it's literally as big as your thumb and it's going to rattle around in there. You know, that's why we tape it parallel so that it stays up against the wall on the outside. And so it's, it is absolutely if you're not comfortable doing an intravenous shot or an intravenous application, then you shouldn't be doing this. You know, that is something that is important to realize. What's going to happen if you get it outside the vein, you know, on the, on the skin side, you know, you didn't see a bleb, you didn't hear bubbles, you know, you didn't, you didn't do it right. You're going to get a whole bunch of thickening and scarring in there. It's not as bad as an, an uh, uh, extravasation of something like butte, you're not going to get any rotting or anything like that, but you're going to get that, uh, you know, that skin's going to get thick. I've had, uh, I had a technician um, who administered some ozone in my own horses and got a lot of it outside the vein on a regular basis. She didn't let anybody know she was having trouble um, that, uh, and she was learning how to do this. And uh, so then those horses had some, just like any old show horse who's been given a lot of tranquilizer he had pretty thick skin over the vein but nothing earth shaking and over a period of a couple of months it all got normal again so again it's not i'm certainly going to give a warning about an intraarterial stick but i mean that is certainly something that you can avoid it is not easy to do and if it only usually happens if the animal thrashes its head around and flexes and pokes at itself or you haven't got it taped down so it's parallel so it's pretty hard to do. I mean, 20, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of ozone administrations by me, my technician, et cetera. And nothing is, you know, nobody's ever done it. So I would not concern myself. Everybody's careful. Everybody's careful. Okay. And so, veterinarians, you guys know how to give an intervenous shot. You know, you guys know how to do it right. If you don't, get somebody to coach you. You know, we've got to make sure that everybody understands that, you know, we have an obligation to have good technique. Yeah. So, so we talked a little bit about, you know, small animals before now uh, for O3 vets, just for us, we've never actually taught DIV at a training. Now that's partially because we never have had large animals there. It's partially because this is again, been a controversial treatment uh, method primarily because of human medicine and especially out of Europe, them rejecting the idea of this being a valid option for humans to do because they don't want people screwing it up and making it worse for everybody else and for ozone in general, which already has a bad rap. So I understand that side of the, the, you know, the, the conversation and the debate. I do think personally there is a place for it in large animal medicine. Um, but but as far as small animals, would you ever do uh, this on a small animal? Oh, I would do a Great Dane. I just don't want to do, I don't want to do a Yorkshire Terrier. And I, I certainly would ha I have had no problem with delivering intravenous um, uh, fluids that have been ozonated and or sub-Q fluids that have been ozonated. And I mean large quantities of that. 
you know, you can give when you've got a cat that's in kidney failure and you want to give it 100 mLs of 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 sub Q fluids because it's really dehydrated. Those can be ozonated at 27 micrograms per milliliter, which is what it saturates at. And you can give them 100 cc's of sub Q fluids. And that is a really effective ozone treatment. I mean, yeah. that is super effective ozone treatment, as is a rectal ozone treatment. Yeah. And that's the thing with small animals. It's so easy to do rectal insufflation or sub Q ozone that um, it, it really isn't necessary to do DID. Yeah. I but, absolutely agree. I don't think, and I, I mean, I, I have a tough time justifying uh, major autohemotherapy when rectal ozone is super, super effective. You know, yeah. it's, it's too much trouble for me to do the, you know, the, the major autohemotherapy um, when minor autohemotherapy, rectal ozone, IV fluids, rectal insufflation, vaginal insufflation, doing ears, all that kind of stuff, bagging them they're going to absorb a major amount enough to be highly therapeutic from any of those routes of, of administration. Yeah. Yeah, uh, exactly. Well, this is, so I uh, really appreciate your time. It's been an hour already. Can you imagine that? I mean, it's <laughs> gone I'm pretty happy fast. To hang out if anybody wants to ask any questions or if there are other questions, burning questions that people want to have answered. So there is one here. Is it mo more irritating in the horse SC? To do it SC? Um, sub Q, I would not do it. Yes, they would get highly irritated about that. You know, and you don't want to put scars and lumps and bumps on a horse either. Nor, though I have never had a uh, uh, ozonated, um, you know, are you talking about doing sub Q gaseous ozone? Boy, yeah, you could cause a good bit of damage doing that. But if you're doing sub Q fluids, you know, we don't do sub Q fluids on horses. You know, they're just not very happy about having anything stuffed under their skin because their skin's tied down pretty tight. Unlike kitties where you can, or dogs where you can pick up the dog, you know, pick up the skin a foot before the dog comes off the floor. The horse doesn't have that kind of room under their skin. But there is no reason not to do IV, uh, 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 DIV on horses. It's exactly the same thing as giving anything else IV. Yeah. You know? exactly the same as giving anything else IV. We deliver fluids on horses. And when we talk about embolization, you know, there's plenty of horses that have been wandering around in a stall in a hospital all night, having pulled their fluids out somehow, and they've had a 14 gauge catheter in their neck that's sucking air for, you know, two hours, and they have not died of an embolism. So you're just, even air, it's very hard to embolize a horse. But I want, there is absolutely, if you can give an IV shot, if you know what you're doing with giving intravenous, you know, uh, uh, administrations of any variety, this is exactly the same thing. Right. Um, okay, well, I, unfortunately, you know, I, I've got a very early morning. I don't know about you, Dr. Shoemaker, but uh, I've had a really good time talking about this. I know there's a lot more questions. Um, and you gave us your contact information in the video. I know if people have more questions about this or other things, they're welcome to send us an email, info at o3vets.com. And we'll, if we don't know the answer, we'll try to get the answer for you. Um, but uh, I really wanna thank you for being with us and for taking your time to bless other people and to help our people. And uh, that's just uh, really kind of you to do. So thank you very much for that. Any final words? Well, as I say, if there are any questions, why don't you direct them to uh, O3Vets so that they can, can be compiled and be available for other people to see what those answers are. So that would probably be a great place to do it. And I will consult with Jonathan. And if there are any questions that you know are directed to me to ask about this, I'd be happy to answer them through O3Vets. If you have some burning question or you guys want to, somebody wants to come to my, my office, my practice is a teaching practice. And so people can come and visit. And so I'd be happy to host you and let you, you know, come and visit and see how we do these things. And uh, I have teaching animals. My, my horses that are here and stuff are happy to let you stick them. So, <laughs> yeah, Great. not a problem. They've been, they've been given, a lot of, uh, given a lot of instruction over the years. So uh, that's what their job is. So just feel free to let us know about that. And as I say, if you have some really burning questions, just let Jonathan know and let's answer them for everybody. Yeah. And, and there's been a few people asked about having, uh, you know, is there a group? There is a Facebook group for veterinarians. If you 
want access to that, um, just write us and we will, or, or go on Facebook and search veterinary ozone and our group will pop up. Um, and you can get access there if you're a veterinarian. Um, and then, uh, it would be great, uh, Dr. Daniel, to have a forum discussion once a month on ozone therapy. Uh, it would be awesome to do that. I think that's something we certainly will consider, but I, I want to thank everybody again for being here. We will have, this is recorded. Um, I also have a document that Dr. Shoemaker made up that we will probably be making available for, that talks about the specifics of what we've talked about here a little bit. And then the video that we saw um, should be available as well, I believe. So all of those things will be available as resources. You guys have a great night and we will see you next month. Bye.